Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to my Bible study with me series through the book of Philippians. If you've been following along through all the different studies, thanks for tuning in. I hope you've been learning a lot. I know that I have been and this has just been a lot of fun. I don't know that I'll do another one of these series right away. There's a couple other videos I've been wanting to make, but I definitely want to start one up maybe sometime soon in the new year. And so if there's another book that you want to see me do the same kind of thing going through, let me know down in the comments. For Philippians 4, we'll just go ahead and dive in. As always, I will read through this chapter out loud on camera, share thoughts I have as I'm reading, and then I'll zoom in to a couple verses to study more in depth. I do wanna tell you though, we're doing a giveaway in this video. So if you've been watching, you've seen me use this Scribe Bible Journal. I've been using this thing for a couple years now. I really love it. And they have been so kind to agree to do a giveaway in this video. And so make sure you stay tuned to the end to see how to enter on that. I'm so excited to dig into this chapter. There's a lot of verses in here that have just meant a lot to me, especially as we've been studying this whole book. I feel like it's given so much more meaning and context to some of those standout verses we hear all the time. So without further ado, if you have your Bible, go ahead and pull it out and turn to Philippians 4. Let's go ahead and get started. Verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. So I did read through my study Bible again for chapter four, and one thing I noted about verse one is that Paul is essentially saying the Philippians' spiritual success would be Paul's crowning achievement. And I just really liked that because I think a lot of times we measure our success by what we have done, and I guess in a way, pouring into the Philippians is what Paul would have done, but by like things happening in our own lives. and. I thought it was cool that Paul's measure of success was the people that he poured into and the influence he made in their lives. And so I'm actually going to make a note about that over here. Whenever I write notes from the commentary in the journaling part of my Bible, I will always write a note saying it's from the commentary. So you can see there because I also use this space to write my own thoughts. And so I want to be able to differentiate like this was from the commentary if I'm ever referring back to that. Continuing on in verse two, I entreat you Wodia and I entreat Sin Tiki, to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So it seems like these two people, Euodia and Sintiki, sorry for probably butchering your names, that there had been some sort of a conflict between them and we don't get any details on what that conflict would have been. But Paul is entreating them to agree in the Lord, to have that unity of mind that he talked about in chapter one. And he's asking you, his true companion, the person I guess who's receiving this letter, but really it would be all the Philippians, to help these women. And so I just thought that was interesting because I think sometimes when there is conflict, there at times may need to be an outside party to help navigate that. And so Paul is telling these two people who have been at conflict to agree in the Lord and then asking the others to kind of come around and help them in doing that. Verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. I want to read a note I took down from my study Bible. I just wrote a couple down on my phone for this verse. It says, reasonableness is crucial for maintaining community. It is a disposition that seeks what is best for everyone and not just oneself. So basically the commentary there is saying that when we are just seeking our own interests, which again, we talked about in chapter two, that that is not conducive to community because that's gonna create all of this conflict. And so in order to maintain community, this disposition of being reasonable is necessary, not just seeking our own interest, but also the interest of other people and the interest of the common good of the community. Continuing on in verse six, and this is one of those popular verses and for good reason. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I feel like there is so much I could say about this verse. There is so many different things that I've learned about this verse and different ways I've found that it applies just over the years. A couple things I want to point out. One, 
is the little statement that comes directly before verse 6. We often hear that verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. We're told that again and again, but it's really easy to miss that little statement and it says the Lord is at hand. When God is commanding us not to be anxious, when he is commanding us to pray, those aren't just standalone statements. Those are responses to the reality that God is near, that God is at hand. He is near in those situations that feel scary and uncertain. He's near in those future scenarios we spin round and around in our heads that make us anxious and he's near when self-doubt feels a lot more tangible than his presence but he is near and when he commands us not to be anxious that comes directly after reminding us of this reality that he is near another thing I want to point out about this verse is the little phrase that says with Thanksgiving again we are commanded not to be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication to present our request to God I think for me sometimes when I am praying for something I really want. Um, I actually made an IGTV video talking about this. You may have heard me say this before, but I can easily become so fixated on the thing that I'm praying for or one specific outcome that my prayers themselves almost start to become driven by fear, driven by anxiety because I'm so set on this one thing happening. And it's almost like I'm trying to, through my prayers, will God into my will. And, you know, God tells us to present our request to him, to pray for the things we desire, to pray for the things that we care about. But I think that that phrase, that little phrase with thanksgiving is so key because I've just noticed when I am so fixated on one thing that I'm praying for when I kind of take a step back and begin to thank God for what I see him doing in the process that is when I find and truly experience the peace that this verse is promising I think that when we're giving thanks what it's sort of forcing us to do is to release our grip on just how we want things to turn out or our will or how we think is the best way things should go and acknowledging God I see you working in this and I see you bringing good from this and even though I don't know how the outcome is going to turn out yet I am going to thank you in the middle of this and I think that is where we truly experience peace. Continuing on in verse 8, finally brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I just want to say that if you are somebody who tends to struggle with anxiety, you find yourself getting anxious about things or worried about things, one of the best Bible verses you can memorize is Philippians 4 verse 6 through 8. This is one that I have committed to memory and I find myself turning to time and time again when I find myself getting anxious about something because it literally walks you through what your response should be when you find yourself starting to fixate on something. Do not be anxious about anything but to present it to God, to pray about it. So often I forget that I can pray about things that I am just naturally worrying about. So it commands us to not be anxious, to pray about everything, to give thanks, to again acknowledge how God is already working in this situation, and to let that request be known to God and know that he is holding it, that he is working on it. And in doing these things, we will experience the peace of God, which surpasses our need to understand the situation, our need to understand or know how things are going to turn out. But it does doesn't just stop there because I think that a lot of times when we're experiencing anxiety it happens when we're really fixated on something we're thinking about and so this verse is telling us to not fixate on those things that we're worried about but then it also tells us what we need to replace that focus with I think that when we try not to focus on something it's really not possible to not think about something like for example if I told you don't think about pink elephants well then what are you gonna think about you're gonna think about pink elephants so if you're trying to not think about pink elephants it's not really as effective to just sort of think okay don't think about pink elephants don't think about pink elephants instead you need to replace that focus and think about something else and as you are thinking about something else your focus is naturally going to gravitate and shift from those pink elephants that was a really weird example analogy thing but hopefully you're tracking and so Paul is telling us to not worry about or fixate on these things that we're worried about but to instead think about these things whatever is true whatever is honorable whatever is just whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is commendable if there's any excellence or anything worthy of praise he's literally giving us a filter through which to bring our thoughts through and to decide if those are things that we should be thinking about continuing on in verse 9 what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me 
practice these things and the peace of God will be with you. He's driving this point home that, you know, you've heard these things, you've received them, you've seen them in me and Paul, but now you need to practice these things. You need to put them into action and that is when you're going to experience that peace of God. Continuing on in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You are indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing hunger and plenty, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So I know that this is one of the most misinterpreted verses in the Bible. I've heard a lot of different people talk about this. This tends to be the verse that's just like slapped on the coffee mug. I want to read some notes I took from a really great video here on YouTube by Jefferson Bethke. He was basically just talking about how this verse is used a lot of times when we are facing something, some outcome that we don't know what's going to happen, maybe like an athlete who wants to win the Super Bowl or a big test we have that we need to make sure we do good on. And we quote this verse as sort of a mantra that I can do this, I can win, I can succeed. But Jefferson Bethke was saying how the context is so important because as we've been reading and as you might remember from the context we talked about in the chapter one video is that Paul is writing this letter from prison, potentially facing execution. And he doesn't know how his circumstances are going to go. And so Paul isn't looking forward at something that he's trying to achieve or a goal of his own that he's hoping to bring to fruition. Instead, he's saying, I am in this circumstance right now and I am going to be empowered to endure through this circumstance through Christ who gives me strength. He's not saying I am setting out to achieve this crazy thing and I can do it because Jesus gives me strength. Like Jesus is sort of this genie that allows us to accomplish whatever it is we want to accomplish or our goals or our desire or our will for our life but instead he's saying this is how my circumstance turned out I have had times when I've had plenty I've had times when I've been in need and this is where I am right now and through Christ who gives me strength I'm going to be empowered to endure and to be content through this situation. So essentially this verse, instead of saying I can and I will win in you know whatever this thing is that I wanna win or succeed in, it is saying regardless of how it turns out, regardless of what the outcome is, God will grace me to endure it. Continuing on in verse 14, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except only you. Even in Thessalonica, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. So Paul is literally saying, you have supplied my need, you sent me maybe food or money or whatever it was that they sent him when he was in prison. And Paul is saying, I wasn't even necessarily seeking that gift, but I want you to be credited for your kindness and your generosity to me. And so again, even in receiving this gift, Paul is thinking about them. Verse 18, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. There's just this confidence that Paul has in who God is that he is more than able to supply every need of his. Verse 20, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever, amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. And the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. For this chapter, the verse I want to dig more into is verse eight. And that is again, that list of all the different things Paul is telling us to focus on. I wanna focus on it because I think it sounds really nice. Like all those words are very pretty, true, honorable, just, pure, lovely. But I really wanna break down some definitions of those words. So. For me at least, and for you, if you're looking for this too, you can have more of a clear understanding of what this filter is of these things that we are commanded to set our focus on. So I'm gonna pull out my journal and we will dig in. I wrote out Philippians 4, 8. Again, it says, finally brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, 
think about these things. I'm just gonna bracket off this command because the command is to think about these things. And so now I wanna study, okay, what are these things that Paul is commanding us to think about? So, you know, I like my definitions. This study is gonna be basically definitions on definitions on definitions. And I've mentioned this before, but the reason I'm choosing to look up the definitions of these words is I think that doing so can be especially helpful for words that are so common like these, like true, honorable, just, words we hear all the time, words that we know the meaning of, because I think that sometimes when we look up the definition, it can give us a better understanding or sometimes show us more nuance to the meaning than we were thinking it had because we just assumed we knew what it meant. So I'm gonna circle all the words I'm gonna get definitions for, so true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, anything of excellence, and then worthy of praise. And I'm just gonna write those all out and then look up the definitions. The first one I wrote out was true and whoa. You know, that already got me because it's saying that true is to be in accordance with fact or reality. And it just got me thinking that a lot of times, at least for me, when I'm anxious about something, it's really not a fact. Like it's something I'm worried might happen or something that I might think that somebody thinks about me, but it's really not ever fact or reality. It's not something I know. And so that's already a checkpoint that I'm often not in line with because it's saying to think about that, which is in accordance with fact or reality. Second definition was for honorable, and that is worthy of high respect or great esteem. Next, I wrote down just, which is based on or behaving according to what is morally right and fair. Next was pure, and the definition is to be free of any contamination. And then lovely, exquisitely beautiful, very pleasant or enjoyable. Next, commendable, which is deserving praise. And then excellent, and the definition was extremely good or outstanding. Last is praiseworthy, which is deserving of approval and admiration. So none of these definitions were crazy different than what I sort of assumed or knew these words to mean. But again, I think it's helpful to just write them out sometimes, if even to just slow down and really think about these words and think about and remind ourselves of what they mean. And I actually thought of a little exercise here for the application section as I was writing out these definitions. And so what I'm gonna spend this little portion doing is I'm just gonna take some time to think about what are the main things I think about just on a day-to-day -day basis what consumes my thought energy a lot of the time. And I'm just gonna write out some bullet points of what those things are and then kind of hold those things up against this list. And then I'm also gonna take some time, I'm probably not gonna have space down here, but I'm also gonna think through what are some things that are these things that are true, that are honorable, that are just, that are pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and praiseworthy. What are some things that are those things that I can think about and can sort of redirect my thoughts toward when I find my thoughts wandering toward things that are not on this list? And then as always, spending some time praying to God in response to his word. That is all for Philippians 4. Now for the giveaway I mentioned, so I will be partnering with Scribe Bible journal to give one of these journals away. All you need to do to enter is to make sure you are subscribed to my channel, be following me on Instagram, and then Scribe Bible Journal on Instagram as well. And then leave a comment below with your Instagram handle. And that's just so that if you win, I have a way of contacting you so we can get you your journal. And I would love to hear your thoughts as to what verse stood out to you most or what you took away from this. That has been one of my favorite parts about doing this Bible study with me series is just seeing the different things that people are learning. So please leave a comment below. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. That helps to support my channel and I always appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you next time. Bye!